how can we read the stories of the Old Testament well? How can we, a person who is out there who is reading through the Bible for the first time, and they're slogging through the Pentateuch and the laws, how do, how do we help someone like that read the Old Testament well? What are some guidelines you can give us? We certainly can do it in this interview. Yes, in the next, I, I, in the next I, two next, minutes. Next two minutes. You please? I've written on this in almost every book I've done like uh, that deal with this, I spend a chapter. So in my Old Testament theology, I have a whole chapter on how do you do theology out of narrative. We call this narrative theology. How can you be sure this is the doctrine that's being taught? And that means one must know how to read it well. Or my Genesis commentary. Again, I took a whole chapter. And at the beginning of every section, I deal with just this issue. How do we know what's going on here? Let me give you, I'll give you an illustration that Adele Berlin said, you don't know what the Bible means until you know how it means. Now, I paraphrased it. She teaches at the University of Maryland. You don't know what it means until you know how it means. So, for example, I, I, it's difficult without knowing the background of my audience, but take the story of Solomon in the first 11 chapters of Kings. Assuming we know something about that story. It begins with the prophet naming Solomon. It ends with the prophet naming Jeroboam, taking it away from Solomon. The next chapter, that's chapter 1, verses chapter 12 at the end. The next chapter, Solomon's kingdom is established. At the second to the end, Solomon's kingdom is disestablished. Chapter 3, you have Solomon's wisdom for good. Chapter 10, Solomon's wisdom misused for selfishness, splendor, and so forth. You get into Solomon builds the outer shell of the temple. Solomon dedicates the temple. Then you have the inner, and that's balanced. In the middle of it, you have his building of his own palace, the Queen's Palace, and all the other buildings, which seems out of place. Now, what happened there is we call that chiastic parallelism. You had A, A prime, B, B prime, as in a pyramid, with a focal point. Now, with that kind of literature, when you get that kind of structure, the point of it, the message of it, is principally that X. Right in the middle. Right in the middle. And right in the middle of the narrative, you have the story of his building his own palace and his Queen's Palace. In other words, he put his palace ahead of completing the temple. I pointed that out in a church, and an elder, this was during the late 1990s when the market was going gangbusters. An elder of the church said, other elders have resigned from my church. They want to take this moment to make money. And I was thinking of resigning too until I saw that, that pivot. And I realized I was not going to put my portfolio before the church, before God. Well, unless you know that, you don't understand that story. You don't know what it means until you know how it means. And that's why we have seminaries to help people to understand. So you can't answer these questions that quickly, really, but it gives you a taste of it at any rate. So that's a, a very good question. So people can begin to learn. This is not rocket science either. No. It takes a, a degree of skill but people can begin to learn to look for these kind of patterns in That's the correct. Old Testament. That's correct. And can use the very good tools that we have out there, like your commentary on Genesis and other books, right. which will give people guidance right. in how to read the text well. My training in university, I put on the lens of source criticism. I could tell you what's J, what's E, what's P, what's D. I, I have that lens. I, that's the lens I was given to analyze. I took those lenses off, and I put on another set of lenses that enabled me to see the text for what it is. And then I could see what it meant really clearly. I was trying to encourage students. I said, I didn't know how to read the Bible until I was 65. And they, I thought it was going to encourage them. We're all learning, you know. They said, 
Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> well, so the main point is that we can't read the Bible well unless we learn how it works. Yeah, and there, there, it, there needs, many... it, needs, it needs balance here. It's like, uh, I think it was Augustine who said, the Bible is shallow enough for a child to wade in it, deep enough for an elephant to drown in it. And so, you know, knowledge is always imperfect. And part of the problem I'm having here is I might discourage people who can understand the Bible. There's enough there to keep us busy and to live by it. Uh, one time I had a student say to me, he said, uh, did anybody understand the prophets? It's the most difficult literature to read. And I said, well, enough to kill them. <laughs> well, got the basic point <laughs> right right so i don't want to discourage people but i do we do want to encourage people to get into the depth and not to abuse the bible either well and what i say to my students is there are various levels of reading the 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 beginner can immediately begin learning things and seeing things in the text that are understandable that they can can gather the problem is if we always live there and we are not in a process of growth and understanding and what I would say is leaning into the text trying to hear what God is saying and learning the skills to learn to read it better it's a Christian virtue a Christian virtue is diligence truth development right. that's a Christian virtue and apathy and laziness indifference those are not Christian virtues and I think we need to be encouraged in those virtues too, to encourage people to engage their minds as well as their spiritual exercise of prayer, for example. And, and I find that when we develop those skills, when it's integrated with the heart, then it becomes very transformative in our lives. Exactly, That's a, I like that word, transformative. Because otherwise, see, I've learned as a teacher there are two problems we have. We, we deal with knowledge to a large extent. Knowledge has two problems to it. It's a, it's a virtue, but it's also a vice, unlike other virtues which are pure. But knowledge is not pure. And knowledge that we're engaged in here, it, has the, it always it tends to puff up. It always tends to have pride. You get two knowledgeable people, there are always going to be a little bit of tension between them. And that's wrong. But it occurs. It's the reality. And the other thing is, it's always imperfect. And what happens then is you, you get anxious. Uh, you become a workaholic. I got to get this exactly right. You become a perfectionist. And I've learned that you have to overcome the virtues of knowledge with pure virtue so that you must overcome what Paul says. It puffs up with love and die to self and understand who you are. But it has to be overcome with pure virtue of love. And the limitation has to be overcome with the pure virtue of faith. I'm not going to know everything perfectly. But what I don't understand perfectly, I still trust God. So that frees us up. So we need to have virtue balancing the virtue and vice of knowledge.